I want to thank you guys. You guys have been a great group for coming out today. We really appreciate you guys being here and uh, taking time to fellowship and minister, and, and especially for Tim Barton and Wall Builders. You know, God is, God is good. Just provide the wisdom that he has. We're thankful. Our first question uh, is very general in nature. It's often said that the USA is not a Christian nation, strictly speaking. Is there a legitimate case to be made that our government and nation was intended to be Christian or at least Judeo-Christian? <clears throat> Tim? Well, it's, uh, I, I don't know if Pastor wants to take this first one, but... Um, <clears throat> Not in disrespect. I'm, no, I'm not throwing him under the bus. Um, so I, one of the things that I think is worth noting is you always have to define your terms. And when somebody says, do you think America is a Christian nation? I, I don't know that I would say yes. Because I don't think a Christian nation would murder more than 60 million unborn children. I, I don't think a Christian nation is confused on what marriage is or on what genders are. I, I don't, that's not the fruit of a Christian nation. Now, it would be different if the question was, do you think our nation was built on Judeo-Christian principles? 100%. In fact, our nation to this day still operates on more of the Judeo-Christian principles than any other philosophy or principles. So even though we have so many major issues, there's still a lot of things we do today because of the influence of Christianity, even though most people today don't know it's because of Christianity. Okay? For example, America is one of the most generous nations in the world. In fact, if you were an atheist in America, you learned that you should treat other people the way you want to be treated. Well, where did that thought come from? The Bible. Do you know in all 50 states, we have what are called Good Samaritan Laws? A Good Samaritan Law is where when we leave today, right, God forbid, but if, if somebody had a wreck in front of us and, and we see this wreck and it tumbles and it rolls and the car is upside down and you're the first one on the scene, so you call 911 and quick, send help. So somebody, there's, there's been this wreck and you go up and as you look in, car's upside down, this person's hanging and you realize like their neck and back does not look right. And if you know, if somebody has a spinal or neck injury, you never move them. So you're saying, hey, hang on, right? Help's coming, uh, you know, maybe you pray for them. But in the midst of all of this, let's say the engine bursts into flames. And now you're going, oh, sweet Jesus, help me. Because I don't want to leave this person in the car to burn or die. Right, so what am I going to do? I'm going to do the best I can to try to get them out of that bad situation. If in the middle of me trying to get them out, if they end up dying because you never, right, again, you don't want to move that spinal injury. If you do, it snaps. If they end up dying, you cannot be held responsible for their death because the law says if you were trying to be a good Samaritan giving aid to someone in need, then you cannot be held criminally liable for it, the aid you tried to render not working out. But here's my bigger question. Where did all 50 states come up with the idea of the Good Samaritan helping someone in need? <laughs> Even if you are an atheist, there are things we still do in America because of the Bible. Now, again, this is why defining our terms makes a difference. I, I think it's foolish to argue that that our nation wasn't built using Christian principles. And some people say, yeah, but not everybody was a Christian. No, that's true. Not everybody was. Benjamin Franklin was not a Christian. Okay, Benjamin, and, and, I, and I say that with the knowledge that we have, because when Benjamin Franklin uh, had three months left to live, the, there was a, a president of Yale University, and the president of Yale wrote him and said, Mr. Franklin, we're doing a hall to honor all the founding fathers. We would like to put a picture of you up in this hall. Do you have a painting that we can use? And Franklin writes back, and Franklin is, is very witty and funny at times. And Franklin says, I don't have a good painting, and all my paintings are like old and fat. I don't want that on display. And he said, but I heard there is a, a new painter it, from Europe in America, I will sit for one of his paintings, and if I like it, I'll send it to you. Now, the, the president of Yale at the time was Ezra Stiles. So Ezra Stiles writes him back, says, thank you so much. I, I hope, you know, hope the painting works. We can get it. He says, there's one thing, though, I need to ask you. I would be amiss if I don't ask you. Where do you stand on the issue of Jesus Christ as Savior? Franklin wrote back and said, 
you know, thank you for asking the question. It's not a problem at all. Because Ezra Stiles said, I don't mean to be offensive and I, I don't want this to come across the wrong way. I'm just curious what you believe. Franklin said, it's not offensive. I'm happy to answer it. He says, but honestly, that is a question that should not be answered lightly if someone has not done the research. And I have never done the proper research to answer if Jesus Christ truly is the son of God, the savior of the world. He said, however, at my old age, I shall soon find out if he is the son of God or not. And that was the last thing Franklin ever said. Franklin then died three months later. And, and so there's no record of Franklin ever coming to Christ. Now, it's also interesting because Franklin was very good friends in his later life with George Whitfield. Very good friends. Franklin was very secular in his early life. In his 40s, he meets Whitfield. They become very good friends. Franklin builds an addition on his house, asks Whitfield to live with him. Very good friends. So the question arises, how in the world... Can Franklin be friends with the most famous evangelist in America at the time and not have heard about Jesus? And the answer is because back then there was such heavy Calvinism that the first great awakening was recognizing the sovereignty of God, but they believe that Jesus has already picked his chosen because this is kind of the heavy Calvinistic thought. And so either you're going to be with him or you're not. And so even from Franklin's acknowledgement, he and Whitfield never discussed Jesus. But the point is, we know that Franklin, up to that point, was not a Christian because he didn't believe Jesus was the Son of God, the Savior of the world. And in the last three months of the possible, he started looking it up. Yes, in fact, I'm sure the Holy Spirit was working on his heart, right? Like, hey, you should check this out. Check it out. I hope in his last three months he did, and, and I, I, I hope that he made it to heaven. But the reason I bring it up, Franklin, to our knowledge, was never a Christian. And yet, Franklin, when he was the governor of Pennsylvania, he actually encouraged everybody in his state to go to church. Franklin had prayer proclamation because Franklin actually was closer to what we would consider an Orthodox Jew because he didn't believe there was a God of the universe who made the world work, who was involved, who intervened. He wasn't sure about Jesus. So a little closer to an Orthodox Jewish position, but Franklin said the reason everybody should go to church, and, and, and Franklin was very pragmatic, but Franklin said because it's the faithful church tenders are not the ones that we have the criminal issues with. So if everybody would just start being a faithful church attender, it would solve the crime in Pennsylvania. That's, that's a really good thought. <laughs> but the point is, this is where you can see that the Bible and Christianity was not only influential, but even promoted by founding fathers, even ones who weren't Christians, they promoted the Bible and Christianity. So in that regard, I could say absolutely America was shaped and built on the principles of Christianity, even by founding fathers who arguably weren't Christians. Tim, what resources are available to teach children American history from a Christian perspective? There's a, a couple really good series uh, called Drive Through History. Um, if you have watched TBN or Inspiration or whatever different Christian programming you have, there's a guy, his name is David Stotts, and he does Drive Through History kind of all over the world where he, on location, it's very a kind of cornball sense of humor, which is perfect for younger kids. Um, he's goofy and quirky and awkward at times, but he will go on location and tell the stories on those the, the spots where they happened. When he did the American history section, we worked with him. And, and by the way, as I mentioned, with it being on Christian programming, he is a strong Christian guy, so very much pro-God, pro-Jesus. Um, when it came to his, him doing the American history section, or that series, we worked with him to get him a lot of original documents and information. And, and as we're saying this, one of the things I heard pastors say earlier in the morning was we want to be Bereans who are people who go and look this up. Everything that I've said today, let me encourage you, you shouldn't believe anything I said. It should just inspire you to go find what's true. Because one of the things that I appreciate that Ronald Reagan promoted was you should trust but verify. Okay. <laughs> I trust pastor, but if he says a verse says something, guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to go look up that verse, and I'm going to see what it says, okay? Because I can trust him, but I'm going to verify, because what if the one time I didn't verify was the one time in the 10,000 that he's been wrong, because it doesn't happen often for pastor, right? Let's just know that. But what if that was the one time he was wrong? Is that on him or me? Well, maybe both, but certainly I bear the responsibility because I didn't do my due diligence. And so this is one of the things that certainly we want to look things up. And so when David Stotts was doing his American history section, um, we gave him a lot of stories and original source information. So as he's telling these things that happened, we have all the original documentation, the, the letters, the journals, 
of what's there. And it's a really fun series for kids. There is curriculum with it too, or there's DVDs. Um, so you can watch the DVDs and not have curriculum. If anybody does homeschool or Christian school, um, there is curriculum that goes along with it. That's a really good place. Um, there's a few others that, that aren't bad, but that's drive through history is a good one. Amen. Well, I have a couple of questions here that are very similar. What can I do to help my country? The other question would be, how can we uphold religious liberties in the workplace based on the U.S. Constitution, the current events that are persistently eroding our rights? Well, Pastor, I think you can answer this really well as, as well. So I would love to answer part and then throw part to you because um, you are way more than just an ornament on the stage. So part of the idea is looking, one of, one of the things that we are so blessed the fact that we have President Trump and his two appointments to the U.S. Supreme Court, this year we have already seen religious liberty upheld and completely changed the dynamic of interpretation for lower courts and, and, and things that we will deal with on a daily basis, such as one of, there's, there's a Lemon v. Kurtz test um, that essentially says if anything has the appearance of religion, it's wrong in public is this ruling from a, a court. Well, they had a, this summer, one of the victories we got, again, from having new justices who have a constitutional perspective and they believe in the First Amendment, which is the freedom of religion. They had a case that was the Bladensburg Cross case. And the Bladensburg Cross was a World War I memorial. It was erected, I think it was 49 individuals lost in World War I. And it was mothers who wanted to honor their sons who were lost in the war. So they erected this massive cross. Well, the government bought the property. And the argument was that you cannot have a cross on government property. This was also in the District of Virginia where Arlington National Cemetery is. So if this case was upheld that argument would then be you have to remove every cross in Arlington National Cemetery of every soldier who's laid down their life for our freedom. So that would have been just wrong on so many levels. But the U.S. Supreme Court upheld that it was constitutional to have this cross because it was not a direct establishment or endorsement of a religion. But what was further is in their ruling, they said that also the reason this was an issue was based on this lemon test that if it looks religious, it has to be wrong. And they said that test will now be changed to where you have to prove that it is not just look religious, that it is promulgating religion. And if you don't prove it's promulgating, then it's constitutional. So it changes the burden of proof, which means when you now look in the workplace, the, the only time it could be an issue was, was arguably federal government. Um, because if, if you work for a private organization and they say, hey, we don't want to talk about Jesus here. Well, I mean, I, I support bosses having the freedom to do what they want. And I also support the free market for us to choose a business who does something different, right? So if you work for a private organization, the constitution gives them the authority that they can make those decisions. If you work for the federal government, that's where it's different because the government cannot compel the suppression of your belief as long, and this is where the argument comes, as long as you are not, um, and kind of being a burden on the workforce, on the workplace. But if somebody asks you a question and you say, well, here's what I believe, you can't talk about religion. Yeah, if they ask me a question, I sure can tell them the answer to it, right? You don't lose your freedom of speech or the freedom of religion just because you work for the federal government, which is where that question would much more specifically apply because if it is to private businesses, I mean, we have an organization that uh, wall builders we run and I, I, I help lead our organization. I don't permit profanity for many of our employees. And in Texas, we have a, it's a right to work state, which means it's a right to hire state, which means I can fire anybody for any reason, anytime I want. And that's legal in Texas, which I totally support the boss's position to do that. But if somebody cusses for me, I can say, eh, we're gonna have to let you go. They can't sue me for violating their freedom of speech. Why? Because I'm a private individual and we had a private contract. This is not a government infringing on your rights, which is what the Bill of Rights is actually all about. So a private business is a little different. Uh, under the 14th Amendment, there's been some complication with this, but when it comes to a private business is different than if you work for the federal government and that general idea. There was a second part of the question though, which was related to promoting, uh, or what can we do on some level? Pastor, that's yes. where I think, yeah, yeah. if you want to address that. Well, you know, uh, boom, 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 is there. Um, as Christians, which would be examples, right? 
even as Peter says that uh, when people accuse us of something falsely that uh, the best thing we can do is to live in such a way to prove them wrong mm -hmm. and so it goes back to the principle of light and salt and so the way we live the way we conduct ourselves how that we do give them the 10 the 8 hour the 12 hour whatever we contract for that are the best and that we are examples and again um, when somebody does ask questions of you you have the right to respond if you're using your employment whether it be uh, personal private or whatever to promote something and just kind of uh, force yourself upon somebody that's wrong in itself because God doesn't force any, anybody to go to heaven so we should not everybody wants to witness and needs to witness but there's a point in time when I can understand I can read the person mm -hmm. that they don't want to hear about it then I need to be sensitive enough to say yeah. you know what I back off Okay, so God has given us brains. We should use them, not sit on them. And um, it, Amen. It, it works out. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Tim, was George Washington a Freemason? <clears throat> it depends. It depends on, on how we define Freemason, because yes, he was, but not in the sense of what it is today. That's like saying George Whitfield is part of the United Methodist Church today he would not be allowed to speak at any United Methodist Church today at all, okay? Because that faith has changed so much. It's one of the things called modernism. One of the mistakes, or, or we call it a malpractice in history, is, is to modernize what something means, okay? The example I use with kids, I'm being sensitive, but this, if I cross a line, I apologize in advance, right? But, okay, back up to the 1800s. What was a faggot? No, that was the 1960s. So long. 1800s, a faggot was a bundle of wood used for starting a fire. Yeah. That was a faggot. In the 1940s, 50s, and 60s, a faggot was a cigarette. In the 1980s and 90s, it was something different. Right? This is where in modernism, words change. And sometimes even the position of an institution or organization can change. And so you have to look back to not just what is that today, but what was it back then? Back then, uh, the, the Freemason uh, was kind of a, really was a fraternity, is, is in essence what it was in the founding era, but it was from Europe. When it came to America, it came with largely British officers. Before the American Revolution, when we were part of the British colonies and the French and Indian War, this is when George Washington joined the Masonic Lodge. And the reason was, in the Masonic Lodge, it's a brotherhood and there's no class distinction. He was a young officer, and he was being friend, trying to be friends and get connections with older officers who in the, the British military. So he joined the Masonic Lodge. He only ever went to six meetings, okay? And all of them were before the American Revolution. Well, the Masonic Lodge, after we separated from Great Britain, many of the lodges stayed around, but the lodges were run by pastors who started the meetings off with Bible studies and Bible verses. And then, I mean, it really was like a fraternity. It was a bunch of guys sitting around, you know, maybe they have a drink, maybe they're smoking a cigar. It was, it was not what we think. We can track historically how in the 1815s, 1820s, uh, 1830s, where there were new leaders, for example, early 1800s, there was a leader who said, we say that there is one God of the universe, the father of all, and his son Jesus, well, saying Jesus excludes certain people, including Jews, who we wanted to be friends with some Jews. So let's just say there's a father of the universe and not mention Jesus, and then Jews can come too. So they drop Jesus. We'll then go forward a couple years and they say, okay, we actually now would like to have other people come who are not Jews and Christians. So what if we say there is a great spirit of the universe because we believe, right, that there's God and whether it's the Father and, right, so, so let's say great spirit. So we can track the leaders and some of the changes they made in very much a more secular and anti-Christian direction. But if you, and, and which really did happen, especially 1820s and 30s is when it started going a very secular direction to where now today it's certainly not a, a Christian organization, although some people would argue, no, we still have Bible verses. Yeah, okay, it's not really the same thing. But if you back up to the founding era, the pastors who were in charge, holding it at their churches, having Bible studies, using verses, etc., nobody questions the Christianity, the faith of those pastors or what they say happened in the meetings. That's where the only meetings that George Washington ever went to. At the end of the revolution, or excuse me, before the revolution, at the end of the French and Indian War, um, when he's no longer an officer, 
he leaves the Masonic Lodge because now he's no longer in the military. He's not trying to be in the brotherhood with these officers anymore. There, of the 250 founding fathers, there only were roughly 12 um, that you could argue were ever part of any Masonic Lodge. But again, the, the Masonic movement changed a lot from the founding era to after the founding era. And we do have this historically documented. So on the website, we have a lot about this. In fact, my dad wrote a book about this many years ago. Um, if you guys want to see more, and this is where I'd encourage you, look for those original sources. Because even the thing where people, there, there's a picture of George Washington uh, wearing Masonic garb, uh, laying a cornerstone. His family was approached in the 1800s and said, hey, can, can we put George Washington here? And they said, nope, he, he didn't want to be there. Well, it was only after his family had died that then they had new leaders and said, well, let's just, just paint a picture of George Washington because he was one of us and, and that way it'll help us promote our group. George Washington and his family never agreed that he could be used as an image for them to promote their organization. Um, and you could argue because they already saw some of the changes of the organization going a different direction, that might be a little more flexible on how much they did or didn't know. Nonetheless, we know they said that they could not use his image. So it was only after they were dead that the Masons used his image. Um, so George Washington never promoted he was a Mason, never. He, he never told people and he only went to six meetings that is known and that was so he could be friends with the officers. So we have a question about deism. Where did deism come into the picture with the founding fathers? Maybe we should <clears throat> define what that is. Yeah, so deism today, the idea is that there is a God of the universe, but he doesn't get involved in our day-to-day -day life. He, he, it's kind of the clockmaker theory. He wound it up and then he let us go. It's argued that a lot of founding fathers held that position. It's, it's very hard to show historically they held that position, except it does get confusing on a few people. If you read Benjamin Franklin's autobiography, Franklin in his own biography says he's a deist. But in the same biography... He says, and I want to thank watchful providence for his interposition in my life. <laughs> a deist doesn't believe God interposes in anybody's life. So this is where one of the things that we have so many, so many projects in our history list um, so that we just try to pay attention if we come on something like, oh, add this to that file. One of the things that has not been well documented, I'm saying this not from facts, but it's more theory right now. So don't tell people, well, this is what, no, 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 it's a theory, okay? But we've seen one person say in a letter that this person was a deist because they did not believe in the divinity of Jesus. Well, that would be more interesting because that actually would fit with several founding fathers who did believe there was a God, but who didn't believe necessarily in Jesus. So that sense does fit, but they, they didn't believe in the deistic term or the deistic idea that God doesn't get involved because Franklin said, Constitutional Convention, we should pray and ask for God's help in this situation. So it wasn't the founding fathers didn't believe that there was a God who got involved. Again, it's more of an Orthodox Jew kind of perspective in the sense that they believe there's a God and God does get involved. But so the theory is, and I've only seen that in one letter. And so we haven't we haven't really found good writings or records of this. Um, Webster's 1828 Dictionary does have a deist as someone who doesn't believe God gets involved. So the earliest known dictionary that gives us an explanation does have a modern day definition. It just doesn't fit with the founding fathers. It would be more accurate to say that there were several founding fathers who didn't believe in Jesus. And that was not the majority either, okay? Don't misunderstand. The majority of the founding fathers actually did write at points in their life about their belief in Jesus, but there were some who didn't believe in Jesus. And that would be more accurate if that was their term for deists, as someone who doesn't believe in the divinity of Jesus, that does fit some founding fathers. Interesting. Now, I, this question is about um, CDs or audio recordings from sermons of past pastors. And I think with reference to some of the uh, pastors that you made reference to in yes. the earlier sessions, which of course would be much too early to have any recordings of, but they're also asking if there are YouTube vi videos available. And I was thinking perhaps of some of resources or uh, talks that Wall Builders has done. Are those available <clears throat> on YouTube at all? Yes, yeah, so we do have a YouTube channel. And it's, it's Wall Builders, if you look it up on YouTube. And we post new videos pretty much every week where my dad and I will, will take someone like a Harry Hoosier. And we just tell their story. Or we might take something happening in culture where if, if you guys saw what happened in Dallas, Texas, 
Um, the Amber Geiger trial. Amber Geiger was the off-duty officer, walked into the apartment, right, shot and murdered this black man, 28-year-old guy. On the stand, his little brother gets up. One of the most powerful things as a Christian, right, because you just, I mean, it's one thing to see somebody else do it, but if you're in that position and you're like, you know what, that chick just killed one of my family members, I'm not sure how that would go. I would pray God gives me the grace for that moment, right? But, but he says, you know, the most important thing is just that you know Jesus and, and can, can, can I give you a hug? Looks at the judge. I know. I, so can, I, can I give her a hug? Go. I mean, just so incredible, right? Touching once this girl to know Jesus. After the sentencing, judge went back to her chamber. Judge got her Bible. Judge came out. It was reported that the judge opened up and read John 3, 16. This is the judge's personal Bible, okay? The judge gave Amber Geiger her personal Bible and said, you need to read this. This will give you hope and comfort. The Freedom From Religion Foundation, who's in Wisconsin, and they think that you should never have religion anywhere outside of the church and maybe not even there. They said, <laughs> they said that this is unconstitutional, that judges aren't supposed to do that. Well, it just so happens we have hundreds of early judge cases where in many of those cases, the judges at the end of sentencing said, and you need to make yourself right, with, especially if it was, if it was a, a capital crime where you're about to die, the judge, and, and some of these were founding fathers, okay? Like signers of document founding fathers. Some of them would say, you need to make yourself right with God because in a few short days you will die and right now you are not prepared to meet God in judgment. You need to get right with God. We have examples where judges, and this is federal judges, district judges all across the board. Judges would say, if you don't know how to make yourself right with God, we can send a chaplain to your cell who can help show you and lead you. But the point is we have dozens of examples from original documents from courtrooms and so when this happened and people are like oh my gosh you can't separation church says you can't do that we did a social media video where we said okay here are these original cases from federal judges district judges here's what they say here's the altar call what happened is not unconstitutional. It doesn't violate the supposed separate church state amendment. So we will do some things that are very cultural, that are relevant based on American history. But we do have a YouTube channel. We're also all over social media. Um, and that would be a, a great place to find some of these resources. Also on our website, uh, I mentioned we have thousands of sermons. A lot of them are on the website. And so if you ever do want to go back and read some of these sermons, you can find a lot of them on the website. Do you, did wall builders have any kind of resources that... Uh, portray the presentation of these facts in a debate uh, platform? Uh, we don't, we've, we've done a couple debates. Uh, we haven't recorded many of them. Um, a, a lot of times it happens more in a Q&A session like this, um, where I'll have uh, every now and then there'll be a, an academic in the room. And uh, already a couple times this year, I, I've had people say things. Um, I had a professor tell me that uh, I shouldn't say that America is, is overall a good nation. He said, because we've done more bad than we've ever done good. I said, really? I said, well, right, well, help me. What, what are all the bad things we've done? He said, well, we had slavery in America and we didn't give women rights until like the 1900s. I said, okay, that's interesting. I said, in the history of the world, what nation never had slaves? Right? Well, well, no, no, no. I said, here's, here's the point I'm making, is that by your argument, every nation in the history of the world is a bad nation because every nation had slaves. Okay, by, by your argument. In fact, I mean, also with your argument, every people group sometime in their history were enslaved and enslaved others. Every people group in the history of the world. Okay? In fact, up until the 17th century, it's been historically documented there were more whites in slavery than blacks in slavery. It wasn't until the Atlantic, North Atlantic slave trade happened that it started being more Africans were taken and so then more blacks were in slavery than there were whites. Nonetheless, right, so I, I, I made the point. I said, so by your argument, every nation in the history of the world is a bad nation. I said, now, can you name a nation where white people went to war and fought other white people and then at the end of the war, they freed all the black people? Right? Like, you could call it a civil war if that helps, right? <laughs> I said, here's the point. 
I said, if I, if, if I agreed and said, no, America's a bad nation, we'd still have to say America is a bad nation with every other nation in the history of the world because we're all bad nations. Amen. But I could counter and say, we could argue we're at least one of the best of the bad nations <laughs> because at least we fought a war in slavery. And then I said, not women's rights, right? Where do women have more rights than in America today? He said, well, I'm not talking about today. I said, well, I know you're not, but, but just, just humor me. Where do women have more rights than in America today? He said, nowhere. I said, okay, and what nation gave women rights before America? I said, here's your problem. You're judging America on a standard that you judge no other nation by, and that's why America looks so bad. There's no doubt America has problems, but when you judge every nation by the same standards, you realize, wow, this nation has done some really special things in spite of all of the problems we've had. Because certainly, we, I mean, we can look back and say, no, that was wrong in these areas, but we corrected the problem before almost every other nation. The point is, some of these things happen in Q&A, and so some of, sometimes those do get posted on social media or on YouTube, but generally, we try to stay away from a debate platform, because generally in a debate platform, we are, you, you don't change the mind of the debater, and it, it generally, we have not found it to be as productive because most people that want to host a debate are not, generally the settings are, they're not very intellectually honest. And so you generally go into a room with people that hate you and you're trying to convince them that you're not the devil. And <laughs> so we, we don't do a lot of debate settings, um, but we do end up in, in a lot of these Q and A's have stuff that comes up that we have to, to navigate. Uh, one of our, our uh, people present today had the question, how can we get the Bible back into the school districts? There actually is a movement happening right now where school districts, it's already constitutional, upheld several times, U.S. Supreme Court, for the Bible to be taught in public schools, but it has to be taught as either literature or history. I'm okay with both of those, Amen. right? Because the Bible is literature. There's never been a more successful book written in the history of the world. So in every literature class, this would be worth talking about, Right? Also, I believe the Bible is true. Therefore, it seems to fit in history. Okay, this is what happened. But what, what they say is that it has to be taught without bias and explanation. What that means is you can't present it from a doctrinal perspective. So you couldn't say, well, here's the way the Assemblies of God views this. Here's the way Calvary Chapel views this. Here's the way the Baptists view this. You have to say, here's what the Bible says. And you can't give a theological doctrinal explanation based on denomination. I support that too. Because I also believe the Holy Spirit's the best teacher of the word there is. Amen. And so let's just present the word and write, that is already true, but at different states, it's upheld in different ways. So for example, in Texas, one of the laws that is passed in Texas is if there are 10 students in the school district who want it, it has to be offered in that school district. That means there has to be 10 students who request or write 10 parents on behalf of their students who request, we want our, our child to be able to take this. So you have to find out what the law is, where you are, but it is constitutional, upheld several times. There's three organizations we know that are working specifically to help get this done. We've worked with all three, helping get them some information regarding history, precedent, uh, early America, uh, and we can get you those names. So there already is things happening along those lines. Um, I don't know that it will ever go back at least maybe not in some of our lifetimes, go back to where it was in early America, but at least the fact that it's now constitutional, at least to have it presented as literature or history is significant. We do know that there were some cases where in some school districts, they could not offer the class because uh, no teacher wanted to teach it because they didn't want to have one more class or they didn't feel qualified or they didn't like the Bible. And so there have been some places that there were some pastors right, who had a master's or had a doctorate, and they said, I would gladly volunteer my time, <laughs> right? And so sometimes there, there, there's, different, there's different hurdles to overcome. All of them are overcomable, if that's the right word. <laughs> Maybe I'm making up words. I don't know. All of them can be overcome, um, but it already is constitutional. It just, there needs to be initiative from us to help make that happen. Amen. And that really concludes our questions for today. Thank you, sir. Thank you guys for coming. And again, our, our interest is to teach you the Word of God and give you 
some um, surplus information such as this, and every year we try to pick a topic, whether it be family, whether it be a prophecy or whatever it is, so that you continue to grow. And again, the greatest example we have is um, uh, those of the past. As they trusted Christ, they studied the Word of God, they were men and women of prayer, they didn't forsake the gathering of the saints, and they lived out their Christianity. And that's, that's all we're, we're called to do. And sometimes things will, uh, even like he's saying in school, you know, we go to the high school. When we first started in Alhambra, we went to every high school uh, for, for lunch. We, we shared the Word of God, and then uh, slowly but surely they started eliminating them because it has to come from within. The student has to, interesting, number 10, because that's the number of men had to be uh, in the city to have a synagogue. Okay, <laughs> so uh, there has to come in from the inside, and then of course we go, Diego and Sam and them go, but but some high schools in some areas they'll be more uh, difficult than others, uh, but it's through prayer and that God opens that door and you continue to to move along, but um, but the greatest place in the world is the church. Yep. That's you and me. The church is not the building; yep. it's the called people of God out of darkness into light as they are transformed by the power and the word of God from day to day, from glory to glory, and that you bear the fruit of Christ in your life and that you get your eyes on Christ and let him have his will. And that goes right against every one of our sin natures. So you got to crucify that old man every day. He will make himself available even while you sleep. <laughs> so let me close in uh, prayer, and we want to thank you for coming. And um, just pray that God bless you guys. Father, we worship you. We thank you. Thank you for this time. And what can we say, Lord? You are so good to us. Lord, we pray for Tim. Your hand be upon him, his dad, the organization. You will raise up more godly men as they go out to just share just your grace over this nation. Lord, we thank you. And Lord, we pray that we would be just uh, that life for the community, Lord. And that your church would be that witness as, Lord, you said it would be. And, Lord, we know that it's uh, healthy and alive. Your church, not everybody says a Christian is part of your church, Lord. So we pray that we would be very uh, assured of our own salvation as we walk with you, Lord. We love you. We thank you, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you.